Okay, so uh, I hope you all got my email about uh, the homework being, the due dates being extended. So uh, we just moved it this way because some of the sections uh, hadn't covered as much as we did in here, and we're waiting for them to catch up. So as a result, um, the exam is only going to cover chapters 1 through 15, not 1 through 18, as previously planned. So uh, we're just going to be going a little bit slower. And we'll... So any questions about that? Okay, so let's look at where we left off last time. So let's go to the document camera here. And where we left off was on page 54. And what we were doing, if you recall, was looking at um, what the expected value and the standard error and uh, of what uh, you'd get if you drew from a known population or a known box. So we have this box here filled with just four tickets. And we're drawing from here with replacement and taking either the sum of the draws, of n draws, the average of n draws, or uh, the percent of some category uh, of, of uh, draws. The percent of what we'd get of, uh, if, we divide, if we change this into a 0, 1 box with n draws. All right, and we saw that we're, re we're relying on two very important rules. Number one, the central limit theorem, which says with enough draws from, uh, no matter what the distribution is inside here, with enough draws, the probability histogram for the sum, the average, and the percent, percent will resemble the normal curve. So uh, that's what we're using here, a normal approximation, instead of figuring out the exact probability histogram. That's the first ru rule we're using. And the second one is uh, the rule, of the square root rule, which says that um, the standard error for what, uh, for your sample average, your average is going to vary. You'd expect to get the average of the box, three, right? But it's going to vary. And um, how much that varies, it's called the sampling error, is uh, the standard error or the sampling error, because each time you take a sample, it varies, it changes. That's uh, defined by the standard error, which, uh, use, which is the, uses the square root law. Uh, for sums, it's the square root of n times the standard deviation of the box. And now we're about to do one for averages, where the standard error for the sample average is the standard deviation of the box divided by the square root of n. Our, av our average is not going to bounce around as much, our sample average, as our uh, sum does. OK. So this is what we're going to look at now. What's the probability that the, if we drew from here, n equals 36 times with replacement, what's the probability that our, the average of the draws would be less than 4? Well, the average of this box is 3. We just add them all up and divide by 4. And the standard deviation is 3 inside this box. We just can figure that out with the long formula of subtracting off, the de taking all these deviations and squaring them. So here would be negative 3. This would be negative 1, negative 1, and 5. And if you squared them all and divided by 4, because there's 4 of them, you'd get 9, and then you take the square root, and you get 3. So that's how we did that. You can see 3 squared is 9, plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. You know, the positives are negative squared are the same, plus we said 5 squared. So that's 25 over 4. And that's 36 over 4. Square root of 9 is 3. That's how we got that. All right, we couldn't use this shortcut formula because there's not just two types of tickets. That's, um, and then we said, OK, we figured out the expected value for the sum. The average inside this box for the sample sum, it's going to vary. We'd expect n, which is 36, with 36 draws. That's your n. We'd expect that times the average, because on the average, you'd expect it, you wouldn't expect to get higher or lower, 
right? So that's 108, but we're not going to get exactly 108 every time. This is, it's, it's going to vary, right? Now, how much it varies is, th how much our sample sum varies is given by the sampling error or the standard error of the sample sum. It just describes how it's changing and how, mu how far off this We'd expect to get this, but you can think of it as error, how far off you'd typically be from that. And that's the square root of n. It depends on two things, the spread in the box, the more it's spread out. If it had no spread in here, you'd get no, you'd always get, if they're all threes or all twos, you'd always get the same thing. So the bigger this is, the bigger your standard error. And when you're doing sums, each time you sum, you get a little more error, but you don't, it doesn't sum as n, it sums as the square root of n. The variance sums as n. So that's what we did last time. Two most important rules in statistics, that square root law and the central limit theorem. We've, and we're using those to, as long as n is big enough, we said 36, is big enough, this box is not very lopsided. It depends if the box is really skewed, like um, if we had a huge amount of eights and then like maybe we had some negative 100 really skewed box, it's going to take a lot longer than 36 straws. But with the box that's pretty even like that, it won't, it won't take very long. So we're using this approximation instead of figuring out the exact probability histogram. And we could always use the normal curve as long as we know what's in the box if we have enough draws. That's the beauty of the central limit theorem. You can always use the normal curve because that's what it says. No matter what's inside here, the probability distribu distribution for averages, sums, and percents is going to eventually look normal. So that's what we're doing here. And so we said, okay, you usually take what your value minus your average over your standard deviation, but for a chance process, this is our value right here. We want to figure out greater than 120. So that's our value minus what we expect the expected value for our sample average right here over the standard error for our sample average. Oh, sum. Ex why am I putting average in here? That is wrong. What are we doing here? We're not doing averages. We are doing sums. So obviously these should be sums. I am so sorry. So that's a sum and that's a sum. We're trying to figure, this is a sum, so we have to take off the expected value for the sum over the standard error for the sum, obviously. All right, so 120 minus 108 over 18. 12 over 18 is 2 thirds, 0.67. So we looked that up in the back of the book between 0.67 and negative 0.67, and we said 50% is in the middle. Now, why did we shade this part? Because we want greater, see? greater than one, that value, so that's what we're doing here, right? That's what we did. Okay, and we got 25%, because 25% on the two tails, 50% in the middle. And now we're going to move on and do the same thing, but now we're interested in the average right here. This says the expected value for our sample average and the standard error for our sample average. Okay, so you could write that as x bar, but average is x bar, and the average inside here is mu if you want, but this is mu and this is sigma, okay? And this is our expected value for our sample average for x bar and the standard error for our sample average. So we could put a little x bar there if you want and a little x bar there. Okay, so now, uh, the expected value, well, inside the box, it's three, so our expected value, the expected value for our sample average is just going to be the average of the box, the average of our population. So it's just going to be mu. What else would we expect, right? So this is super easy. This is just three. And, but now, how much does it bounce around by? Well, it's SD of the box, which is sigma, so this right here, um, I'll just do it over here. The standard error of the average is equal to SD of our box, of the population, right there, that's sigma, over the square root of our sample size. 
So in this case, it's 3 over the square root of 36, which is 0 0.5. Okay? Any questions on that? So now, um, all right, so now we can use the normal approximation. So uh, the normal curve, and what are we interested in? Our value is this, less than 4. So we're going to get a z-score. And we're going to take our value minus our expected value, and this time it's for averages, over our standard error. So it's 4 is our value minus 3 over 0 0.5. So our z-score is 2. So that's pretty easy because that's one you know offhand between, first of all, let's just remind you what you're doing here. So as a z-score, we have this 0, 1, 2, and 3, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. But as a sample average, like this is our sample average, what do we have? We expect to get 3, and we have a standard error of 0.5, and so this is 3.5, right, and that's 4. That's why 4 matched up with 2. Okay? So between 2 and negative 2, right there, between 2 and negative 2 is 95%. But what area are we interested in? Are we interested in that? What are we interested in? Everything less than. So at this whole middle area, we want and that tail, because we want everything less than. So in the two tails, is 2.5 each. So the area of interest is 97.5%. OK. Any questions on that? And now the last one. These are all done very, these are all just pretty standard. We did this uh, before when we just had a list of numbers. Now we're doing it for these random variables, for these numbers generated by a chance process. So now we're just interested in the percent of twos in 36 draws. Okay, so the percent of twos. When we look at this box, percent, you always change it to a zero, one box. So if you have a, you can just change this. We're just interested in counting the twos. Print a set of two. So this is not a two, so we count a zero. This is a two. This is a two. So that's our box. And you can see 50% of the box is ones, or 50% is twos here. It's the same. So, of course, the percent of twos is going to be the same as in the box. So you didn't really even have to change it to a zero, one box to get the percent of twos. It's just going to be same as in the box. So let's write that down. The expected value for the sample percent, that's what's going to be changing. Our percent in the sample, our, in our box, it's fixed. So we'd expect in our sample 50%, same as in the population, is equal to the percent in the population, the percent in the box, which is the same as the percent in the population. Okay? So in this case, it's 50%. Same as in the box. Now, uh, but what about this, the standard error? Well, to find the standard error, now we do have to change it to the 0, 1 box. And so what is the standard error of our sample percent? That's what we're doing. What's our, it's changing, right? And what is it? Remember, it's the standard deviation of the box, sigma divided by the square root of n. It's the same thing, because if you take the average of this box, you get 0.5. It's just an average. So it's exactly the same, except if you want to change it to a percent, you multiply it by 100. That's the only difference. Otherwise, if we didn't, we'd get 0.5. Excuse me. I mean, we'd get it is a decimal, so if it was 50% was the answer, we'd get 0.5. If 2% is the answer, we'd get 0.02. Okay, so now, um, why don't we just can do this? All right, 
So now, do you remember how to take the standard deviation of this box? Remember when it's a 50-50 split? Do you remember what it's going to be? What well, we can do it. We can, you know, do it with the shortcut, the standard deviation. The numbers on the tickets are A and B. There's just two types of tickets, 1 minus 0. But that's just 1, so you don't really even have to worry about that. Times the square root, there's four tickets. Two of them are one type, and two of them are the other, and we multiply. Those have to add up to 1. That's the same thing as saying when you have a 0, 1 box, it's a 50-50 split right here. So it's the same thing as saying 0 0.5 times 0 0.5p times 1 minus p. Those two things are the same for a 0, 1 box. And we get the square root of 0 0.25, 25. The square root of 25 is 5. This is 0.5. So that's our standard deviation right there. So we have 0 0.5 over the square root of 36 times 100. Um, and that's really good just to know when you have a 50, you know, the average is a half and so is the standard deviation when you have 50% ones and 50% zeros. <laughs> and this is 8.33%. Okay, so that's what goes up here, 8.33%. So now we're ready to do um, uh, this again. So we have 0, 1, 2, and 3, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. And z is going to be our value minus our expected value over our standard error. And what are we talking about? What kind of ex we're talking about percents? So, um, and here's our value, more than 60%. That's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to locate 50%. So we have our values, 60%, excuse me, are 60% minus our expected value is 50%. So we're 10% away, but we don't know how much that is in standard errors until we divide by it. How many, uh, so we have to divide by the standard error how much it is in z-scores. So 8.33%. And we get one, a z-score, all the percents cancel out, and then we get those pure units, 1.2. So if I was going to draw the picture with the other axis of the sample percent, we expect it in the middle, 50%. It's not always 50%, it's just whatever was in the box, right? That's what we'd expect. And, um, but we want to know where 60% is. We know it's 10% away, 10% up. But in terms of standard units, that's each one of those is 8.3. So we got like 1 would take us up to 58.33. But we wanted to go up to 60% right here. And we say that's a z of 1.2. And what do we want? more than 60%. So this is the area of interest. That's what we have to figure out, but we have to do it the easiest. I mean, you could look it up on a different t chart or on the uh, computer, but I'm getting you, you know, I think it's useful to imagine the middle area here, and that's how our table is, and that's how it will be on the exam. And between 1.2 and negative 1.2, we can look that up. Um, right here, 77, well, let's just round to 77%. So that'll be in the middle. So that means 23% on each tail. So 23 divided by 2. So that's 11.5% here and 11.5% here. They have to add up to 100. So the area, the area, When I get down to the end of this page, if I touch anything, let me show you. If I touch any of these controls here, what happens is the thing turns off. So it's really hard for me to, when I get down here, I'm trying to be really careful. See? So the area is equal to 100 
minus 77 over 2, 11.5%. Okay, that's good. My handwriting's going to get really ugly down there because I can't get the right angle on it. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes. The question was, will you have a chart on that exam? You have the same exact normal table as in the back of the book. All right. Now, let's see. Why don't we... This is, this is a useful thing to look at if you have an exact number, like the, exactly, not like exactly 60%, something like that, rather than an area. How would you do that? You'd basically take a, make this into like 60, a tiny, because the area of this right now is zero. So you'd make it into a tiny little rectangle going up to 60.5 and down to 59.5. And those would be the endpoints of the interval. That's called the continuity correction that you use for discrete, see we're using a continuous curve here for discrete data. So that's what this is about, but I think we're gonna skip it for now. Um, if we have time later, we can do it, but it won't be on the exam, So, and we're gonna skip it for now. Maybe if we have time later, we'll do it. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to, uh, These are very important. Always read these summaries. I really want to stress that, but especially when you're studying to know what's in each chapter. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do sampling and inference. We've been doing sampling, but we've sampled from a known population, like for gambling games, when you know what's in the box, when you know all the odds, and we've been looking at the sampling distributions, that's extremely easy direction to go in because you can make exact probability histograms, and we know, if we know what's inside the box and we're just sampling from it, if we actually know what's in the population, then we can always apply the central limit theorem if our sample size is big enough and use the normal curve. Now, what if we don't know what's in the population? Like polling, we take a small sample from a big population to, uh, to in make an inference about a larger population that we don't know about. All we know about is one sample. Well, we're going to use the principles we learned going in the easy direction, the probability histograms, but we're going to have to make some slight adjustments to them um, because now we don't know, we just see one sample and we don't know the distribution of the population. So we're gonna have to make some adjustments, but the idea is gonna be basically the same. We're gonna be using the central limit theorem and we're gonna be using the square root law. We're just gonna tweak it sometimes, that's all. So let's start, so first let's just make sure we know what we're doing here. So I said in our discussion of chance of variability, we started with games of chance because they easily translate into these box models. Now we're going to look at how chance is involved when we, when we um, take a sample from a large population. So we, you know, why do we do this? Because we don't have the resources except when we take a census, then we, then we sample the entire population, but we don't have the time and money. So right now this is going on very uh, intensely. I'm sure every day you're reading in the paper about the uh, political polls that are happening and how they're changing and how much we can trust them or not trust them. So uh, they're taking a small sample of people from the whole population and trying to infer from that how the population's gonna vote, like in the primary tonight, they're doing it right now in New Hampshire. I just looked at some polls this morning and they wanna know just from like 800 people how all the uh, thousands of people are gonna vote in uh, the primary tonight and they're putting error bars around that. So they're making a point estimate, the expected value for the percent, and then they're putting margin of error, and they're doing it by the square root law, just like we are, we've already seen. That's what we're gonna head into. But first, some ter terminology, we've already had this. So the population, take a sample from the population, you wanna make an inference, a generalization, um, 
from your sample statistics, you get the sample statistics and you may infer something about the population parameters. And now we have to be a little bit more careful about um, our terminology here. So we're going to use these Greek letters um, for the population here, and here we'll use these Roman letters, usually. Okay, the idea which we want to think, keep in mind is that the population is fixed. We just don't know it. It's not switching around. I mean, in any particular time, it's fixed. We just don't know what it is. What's varying is our sample statistics. They're bouncing around, so we're attaching standard errors to them. It's a measure of how much we think they're varying. And that is going to, we're going to follow the square root law again to do that. So, but before we do that, um, the main idea is what? We want a sample to be as representative of the population as possible. And um, this is exactly the same issue that we talked about when we wanted the treatment and control groups to be as like as possible. Okay? And we saw that random uh, division was best for achieving that because it eliminated uh, selection bias or human bias. We still had random by, uh, chance error. Okay, so this is similar to treatment, very similar. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on it because we've already discussed this with uh, treatment and control. It's similar to treatment and control should be as alike as possible. Now, that's what... Okay, so there's different ways to do it. And the history of polling is very interesting. Now it's changing a lot because it's hard to get a random sample. But we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let's just um, think about the different ways that we could do it. One way to do it is called quota sampling, where the researcher hand picks the sample to resemble the population on all the relevant characteristics. And uh, before people realized, uh, you know, this is how people used to do it before they realized that random sampling was better. Um, for, the, you know, for example, if the population is 50% female and 50% Democrat, you make sure the sample is um, as well. Okay, that's one way to do it. And um, again, that's good as a first step. You could sort of make sure, uh, you know, to sort of block first or stratify to make sure. But then the last step should be um, randomization. You have to, at the last step, you, otherwise you'll introduce human bias. And that's very apparent if you look at the history of polling, that people have very uh, strong preferences, even if when you do this, if they, if they get to pick at the end. So this is good as a first step. Well, first of all, if you don't, just the way it's written now, it's bad. Okay, so this is bad right now because it's going to introduce selection bias. It has no mention of randomization here. Now, what about the self-selected sample? That's the researcher publicly posts the survey and allows anyone to, to respond. This is terrible because the people who respond are not representative. This is, these are often known as uh, push polls. There aren't as many of them now, but I remember seeing Trump posting one um, that done by Breitbart News. I could show it to you where it said 97% of the population or something thinks he should not be impeached. 97.5 and only 2.5 does, and it had thousands of responses. So these are terrible. They're meant to sort of influence public opinion often rather than reflect it. So this has huge selection bias because the people who are, feel strongest about an issue are going to be the ones who are going to go to that site. Okay, 
So this is terrible, this is bad, and probability sampling, randomly sampling, is best for the same reason that random division into treatment and control is. It's, um, it's everyone, the idea that you'd like to have is the simplest, is simple random sampling where everyone in the population has an equal chance of being chosen. But um, generally speaking, that's not, this is far from done now because of uh, people uh, don't answer their phones or they don't want to uh, respond. So they do something, they have to weight the responses differently. But there is certainly uh, an introduction of uh, probabilities. It, it is still random, but it's not simple random. And this is the best. We'll talk about so, all right, so this is the best because why? Because random sampling um, eliminates selection bias. There's still non-response bias, not everybody, but at least in who you're selecting, it's random. So it's best for that reason. And here, why don't I say, this, lo this would be okay if, um, it would be good as a first step if you did it sort of as blocking. Um, but the last step always does involve some kind of randomization. Otherwise, um, selection bias is introduced whenever humans decide. Within these categories, they tended to select the richer people is what happened. All right, now um, let's look at some more stuff here. So as I said, we, oh, so, sorry, here, Wiki, you can... You hadn't finished? Go ahead. Okay, y'all done here? All right. So, remember what our goal is. It, the goal is to make, let's write this down here somewhere. Um, we really want to do the goal is to make the treatment, no, that's in randomized experiments. You want the treatment and control to be as like as possible. Here, the goal is what? To have <coughs> the sample as much like the population as possible. So that's what we we're trying to do. And so random samples, um, we've seen that blind chance works better than human judgment. Um, not only on the characteristics that you've identified as relevant, but you don't always know what's relevant. Um, but on all character characteristics. And especially when the... Um, in an uh, election where there's unusual, like where people who've never, who traditionally don't vote uh, are going to be voting and so forth, it's, uh, we might not identify all the characteristics, so it's much better to have the random sampling. Okay, so it, in uh, random, what's the, why? Because random differences average out. That's why. Whereas um, systematic differences don't that would be introduced by selection bias. And then also that we can uh, translate them into these probability models and use our standard errors. So that's also important. S otherwise, if we didn't have any kind of uh, probability model, we wouldn't be able to describe, we wouldn't be able to attach margins of error to our estimates. So this allows us allows us to calculate standard errors, margin of errors. All right, so now um, 
So probability methods eliminate selection bias. That doesn't mean it's eliminating bi bias. Far from it, because there's this one now is enormous. And it's become such a problem that pollsters are doing lots of different creative things to, to deal with it. Non-response bias used to be that about, at one time, about 90% of the people or 80% of the people who are contacted by telephone, random digit dialing, answered the survey. Now, it's like 2%, it's tiny. So, why is that a problem? Why can't they just call more people? It's because the people who answer are systematically different than the ones who don't. For example, my mom lives in a retirement home, and I've been there when she or some of her friends have gotten surveys, they usually answer them because they have a lot of time on their hands. And so you get the older people are uh, overrepresented compared to younger people. I mean, how many, um, if you got, if you, uh, somebody called you on your cell phone, I suppose they're now calling on cell phones. They didn't used to for a while, but now they are, or on your computer. How likely are you, because most of you don't even have landlines, how likely are you to, uh, Answer. Raise your hand if you would answer, generally speaking, a survey, a political survey, like who you're planning on voting for in the primary, let's say. Zero percent here, right. That's what I'm saying. Very, very, did anybody raise their hand? I don't think so. So what happens is that what they have to do is, um, so it introduces what's called non-response bias, because the people, young people in particular, are not going to be answering. Um, so they're, system so it, they're systematically different than the people who answer. So they, researchers reduce this bias by weighting the responses of people according to the difficulty of obtaining their response. If your responses are hard to get, you're weighted more. And there's some clever ways that people are doing this. The other thing that they're doing, like what Nate Silver does, is he doesn't even rely on one poll. He aggregates, he never looks at just one poll, he aggregates lots of polls together. So um, it, 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 I know people are always um, saying the poll, pollsters are getting it wrong, but, it, but they're doing amazingly well. What people forget about are the margins of errors. Even in 2016, for example, um, the 538, Nate Silver's site, was all those elections that uh, were, within a mar were within his margin of error. So uh, when there's very close races, when there's very close races, it's hard for the polls to predict. And they're really not doing such a terrible job. Um, so um, now the response bias is something you're probably also familiar with, and that is that you can you're gonna get different responses depending on how you phrase a question. So this is very important too, and this is pollsters have to use the same phrasing. They have to be careful about this because you can really bias the answers in one direction or the other. For example, responses to, this is a notorious one, um, abortion are gonna be different if you phrase it as a woman's right to choose as opposed to killing an unborn baby. You're gonna get different responses. This is, I mean, even on an exam, like when I'm not trying to um, bias the results one way or the other, if I, when I make different versions, I have to be extremely careful because some of them are harder for students to answer than others. And so I have, after so many years of experience doing this, I'm pretty good at it. But in the beginning, it was pretty shocking to me how phrasing the question one way or another or using different types of different numbers or something really changed the level of difficulty. And you don't want to do that. You want to, you want the, two versions to be exactly the same level of difficulty. So you have to be, that's another uh, way. So the response bias, you have to be very careful about that. All right, so there's many, many sources of bias. And even if they were all eliminated, let's say they were all eliminated, right? We'd still have chance error, right? We'd still have chance error. You're, even if we didn't have any bias at all, just like we saw with the gambling, there's no, you know, no bias, there's still a lot of chance error. So the way that you, what you're trying to do is you're, you have this um, sample statistic, that's our estimate, so let's just write this down. We get this by, by random sampling. So you have a sample, a random sample statistic. 
Okay, I mean, you don't have to. You could have any stamp statistic, but the best is random. And then you're, what are you doing? You're estimating this population, population parameter, it's easy to remember, P and P, sample and statistic. And then what you try to do is you, this bias. You, the basic idea is you try to reduce this by random sampling, some type of random sampling method. Okay, and then, but always, you're left with this chance error. And this is what we calculate with, um, and what pollsters calculate with standard errors. And they use the same formulas we have. That when you see that margin of error, it's generally 95% confidence interval, it's, 20, it's two standard errors. Oh, we haven't talked about confidence intervals. That's to come. Okay, so the advantage of probability sampling is that we can calculate the likely size of the chance error by using these probability models. That's what we're doing. Okay, so now moving along, we're going to talk about something called confidence intervals. So that's just basically how we're going to attach a margin of error to our estimate, to our point estimate, um, and then, and say, uh, how confident are we that that margin of error captures the true population percentage? Okay, so that's what we're gonna do now. Inference. Okay. And the main way that it differs from what we did before is because we don't know the population, we just know the contents of one sample. Before, with Gamley and all, in the chapter nine and all the, uh, normal approximations we did using the central limit theorem and the square root law, we knew what was in the box. So we didn't have to, if we wanted to, or if we could program a computer to figure out every possible sample and all its, like, all its likelihoods, exactly. And we just said that can be approximated with a normal curve. Now we're in a completely different situation. We just see one sample and we're trying to make an inference about the contents about that about the population or the box. So thus far, we've known the composition of the box and used it to draw conclusions about the composition of all the possible samples, the sampling distribution. That's what we've been looking at, sampling distributions of the average, the percent, and the sum. Now we're gonna go in the opposite direction, which is much more common, unless you're gambling. We know the composition of one sample, and we're gonna use it to estimate the composition of the population. Okay, so here's an example. So, um, so in, in um, April of 2018, ABC poll of, um, it was a random poll here. Do I say that anywhere? No. So it's a random poll of 1,002 adults nationwide, randomly selected. Of course, they had to poll a lot more people to get the 1,002 because of the non-response bias. Okay, ask the following question. Do you or does anyone in your home own a gun? And so now we've got this, in our sample, 47% said they did own a gun, which I thought was pretty high, but I guess that's about what it is nationwide. So 47% said they owned a gun, that somebody in their household owned a gun. Now, so estimate the percentage of American adults who would answer yes to this question. Does anyone in your house? So we're just gonna, this is a no-brainer. If in our sale, this is our best guess, okay? Same as the population. All right. I mean, same as the sample. Our expected value for the percent in the population is the same as what we got in the sample. All right, now, what is the standard error of the sample percent? So we're gonna assume these were chosen as a simple random sample. So let's set up a box model and see what this is. See what it looks like. So what would it look like? It's a yes, no question. So we can say the yeses are ones, because we're looking at the percentage of yeses, and the noes are zero. So there's some percents, but we don't know them. So we don't know the percents in the population. We don't know them. They're a mystery. 
Now, how many tickets are in this box? There's millions of tickets, one for each U.S. adult that could be sampled. It's a nationwide, where does it say that? Nationwide adults, okay. So it's millions of tickets. We don't need to know the number inside the box. We just know that there's a lot, millions of tickets, one for each um, U.S. adult. Okay, so now it's probably about 200 million, but it doesn't matter. That number is never going to enter into our calculations, the population, how many are in the population. Now, what do we do? We randomly draw out of here a sample. So we draw a random sample. This is what we're doing here. This is our population right here. And our sample is something that we draw out of here randomly. So we draw um, what? N equals, where is N? Where's the 1002? Right here. That's our N. We draw N equals 1002 tickets out of here. And that's, we draw that many times. That's the times we draw. Now, before we were drawing with replacement, are we going to draw with or without replacement here? What do you think? Once you call somebody and get a response, do you think you're going to call them again? No. So this, these samples are done without replacement, unlike the gambling. So it's without replacement. So, okay. And then, and what do we get? And we get 47 percent ones. That's what we know. Okay? That's what we've got. So we drew out of here, randomly draw out of here that many times. Now, um, so now it's a little bit different than what we did before. Because if we're going to, we, we got this, but if we're going to get the standard error, let's look at our formula. Can we use this formula? This is the formula we've been using. First of all, we don't know the standard deviation of the box because we don't know the percentages here. If we did, then we wouldn't be taking a sample. We'd know it. The whole point is to estimate it. So we're kind of, so that's a problem. And then the other problem is, that's the first problem. The other one is that this formula is based on drawing with replacement. Remember? It was with replacement. <coughs> if we drew... It had to be with re replacement. We only had a few tickets, remember? Like, look, if we drew 36 times, we couldn't even do it. After four times, you, after four times you're, you're going to have no sampling error. You're going to have, you'll have drawn all the tickets. You know exactly what you're going to get, right? If you're doing the sum, the sum's 12. So if you draw four times without replacement, you'll always get 12, and you can't even draw any more than that. These are always done with all our, they were independent draws. The chances remain the same, right? So that this formula depends on with replacement, and we're drawing without replacement. So how are we going to deal with these two things? So let's think about it. And so this is just sort of the reasoning behind what we're going to do. All right, so let's deal with it one at a time. Let's deal with this. We don't know the standard deviation of the box, and that is a problem. So what do we do? We do, we use the sample standard deviation as an estimate of the population standard deviation. It's not going to be exact. How far off are we going to be? Let's think about it. So if we calculate the sample, sample SD, let's think about it. Um, so the standard, we have a zero, one box, right? And we can't use these percents, so instead we're going to use this, this 0.47 for ones, which would mean 0.530. So that's what we're going to be using. Now, um, so remember that the standard deviation of zero, one box is the fraction of one type of, of ones times the fractions of zeros, okay? And this is the same as our usual formula here. So if we did it with the sample SD, 
our sample SD, let's just see, this isn't the box SD, this is the sample SD. It's going to be the same as this. The 1 minus 0 we don't have to use, that's just 1. So we're just going to say the square root of 0.47, because that's what our sample percent is, times 0.53. has to add up to 1. We're multiplying, but remember it has to add up to 1. Don't say 47 times 53. Make sure what's in here adds up to 1. Okay? It's the fraction, of, which is the proportion. And so I did that, and I got about 0 0.499. Okay? So that's what we're going to be using as our estimate. And we'll see how, first let's do it, and then we'll see how far off we're going to be. Okay, so what we're going to do then is now we can use our regular formula, our standard error for the sample percent, right? That's what we're doing here. The sample percent is equal to the standard deviation of the box, sigma, which we don't know, over the square root of n times 100. So what we're doing is we're using this sample SD to estimate the population SD. That's what we're doing. And so we get the square root of 0 0.499 over the square root of what's n. Remember what our n is. It's way up here. It was how many we sampled. 1,002 times 100. And I got approximately 1.58% rounded to two decimal places. So that is the standard error. So now the question is, all right, how much accuracy is lost in using that standard deviation of the sample to estimate the standard deviation of the box? How much of a problem is that? Yeah? We take the square root of, okay, his question was, why do we have a square root in here? Remember this formula that we have for the standard deviation of the box is the fraction of, it's like tickets that have like one number on it. Remember that? Below it. Oh, that's wrong. Why did I do that? Because I was wrong. Thank you so much. You get next. We don't take the square root of it, duh. That's already it, sorry. Thank you very much. I'm glad you said that. Okay, <clears throat> so, so how much is lost? Um, almost none, why? When you have zero, one boxes, the standard deviation has to be between zero and 0.5. It's not like um, boxes that have other numbers in it besides just zeros and ones. It has to, the biggest it can be is 0.5 when there's a 50-50 split and the smallest it can be. So even if we happen to draw a really strange sample, this sample SD will be close to the standard deviation of the box. So unlike having um, uh, not just uh, categories, zeros and ones, if we had any range of numbers we could get we could be very far off, but here we're not going to be very far off. So, for example, compute the state. Let's look at um, two very different samples. Sample A has 50% ones, and sample B has 60%. What's the difference in their SDs? It's not going to be very much different because the 50%, the 50% ones, 50% ones is going to. What's that SD going to be? That SD is going to be equal to what? The square root of 0.5 times 0.5, which is 0 0.5, right? Now, imagine 60% ones, a sample that had, let's see, those are really very different estimates. And if we have 60% ones, then what's going to happen? Then the standard deviation would be the square root of 0.6 times 0.4, which is very close to that. That's approximately 0 0.49. So basically what I'm saying is for 0, 1 data, 
we can make it a little bit more accurate by using something called an unbiased estimator, which we're going to look at in, in a minute and put an n minus 1 down there. But hardly anybody does that. They don't bother. And they certainly, um, you know, they just don't usually do that. It doesn't make hardly any difference. And I, people just don't generally do that. So they just leave it like this. It's not going to make much difference. Okay. So for um, for zero, because we're going to look at uh, using something called a t distribution soon, and I just want to say for for zero one data, you never you know you don't use it. For zero one boxes like per these percent problems, the sample average is what the sample average is just the percent point four seven. Right here was our average. We got 40, let's say we got 47 ones, 47% ones, 0.47 is the average. The sample average is just the percent. You know, the sample average is the sample percent, which gives you, um, sample average is equal to the percent in the sample. This doesn't look right, does it? OK, the sample average, I'll just say, is equal to um, the percent. I'll just make that your sample percent. It's just equal to your sample percent as a decimal. And, um, and that gives you, you know, what I'm trying to say is that your sample average gives you your standard deviation. You know the sample average is 0.47? That gives you your standard deviation. Whereas we're going to look ahead to a different where we're going to have to use something called the t-distribution, where our sample average has nothing to do with our standard deviation. You know, if you just have, if I tell you the average of, your cl of the class was uh, 65 or something on the exam, you have no idea what the standard deviation is. Whereas if I tell you that 65% of the people passed, you know right away what the standard deviation is. So this is why, so you get a very, just from the sample average, you get, you know what the standard deviation is, and it gives you a very good estimate of the standard deviation of the population. So we can just, so for zero in boxes, the sample average, which is just the percent, you know, i.e. the percent, we can call it, usually you call it p hat, the percent in your sample, gives you, gives you the what? Sample SD. You don't have two separate estimates of it. That's really important for later on. Because what is it? It's the square root of P. I'll put a little hat over it, times 1 minus P. That means the sample. For some reason, people don't use pi. You know, the Greek Roman. All this, all this notation kind of gets in the way if you introduce it too early. But generally speaking, pi would be for the population, but pi also means 3.14, so people don't use that. So they use these hats to be the, you'll see that later on. So it's a very good estimate of the population, the SG. That was probably too much information too early on, and I see some people falling asleep. You'll understand it later on. Okay, but the sample average gives us the sample ST and is a good estimate of the population ST. That's the idea. The sample ST is a very good estimate of the population ST. Unlike later on when we hit averages. All right, so that's problem number one. Now problem number two. Problem number two is what? That we're sampling, actually sampling without replacement when we should those formulas depend on with replacement. So what do we need to do? We need to what? What about the second problem? How does drawing without replacement change the SCE? Well, can you see that when you do it without replacement, you're going to reduce the variability in the box? Think about it. If you drew out all the tickets, you'd have no variability. So it's going to make your standard error smaller. OK? So it reduces the standard error. 
If you drew out all the tickets, you'd have no standard error. You know, you're not replacing them. Your standard error will be equal to zero. So people don't worry about it too much because they love conservative estimates. So if you don't worry, you're always going to be giving a more conservative estimate if you just forget about it. Because people like to give conservative estimates. But actually, there is a different formula, and I should uh, tell you what it is. Standard error without replacement, you have to multiply by this correction factor, and this is the correction factor. So in our previous example, where n is the population size and little n is our sample size. So our pop in our previous example, I said millions of tickets. Let's say there's 200 million adults, U.S. adults. So that would be big N minus little n over big N minus 1. So that would just reduce it by that much. That's just so tiny, people forget, don't even bother with doing the correction factor. But what if the sample size is um, a big chunk? Let's just think about it. When the sample size is small relative to the population, the correction factor is very close to 1, as you can see. But when it's large, then you're going to get this variability. The box is going to be reduced, and you, do, you should use it. So. Um, we can look at this. Let's say if it was as large as 20% of the population, then the correction factor would be about 0.9, which hardly affects the SE. Let's just look at this. What do I mean here? So if it's 20%, you can just say, let's say our big N was 101, OK? And 20% of that, our little N, is 20. Then what would be the correction factor? It's the square root of 101 minus 20 over 100, which is the square root of 81 over 100, which is 0 0.9. That's where I got that, about 0 0.9, right there. Well, what happens if it was 50% of the population? Then let's say n um, is equal to 101. And let's say we had n equals 52, just to make it easy to calculate. Then we'd have 101 minus 52 over the square root of 101 minus 1. And we'd get the square root of 49 over 100, which is equal to 0.7. So you might want to do it then, if it was like half the population. But it's so rare. When you when if you could sample half the population, you might as well sample the whole thing. And we usually we never get anywhere close to that, OK? So this is really surprising to you that um, probably this is surprising to everybody. People always say, how can a sample size of like 1,000 um, accurately predict what, how all U.S., how all 200 million or however many millions of um, U.S. Uh, adults are going to vote, for example. Everybody always says, you know, how can you do this? Well, the idea is think of sampling as tasting. As long as you have a well-mixed sample, which is random sample, basically, you don't need um, a bigger sample because you have a bigger glass. Like, let's say you're tasting some drink or some new drink at a, you know, and as long as you stir it up and it's well-mixed, like, um, it doesn't matter if you have, you could taste, just because you have a bigger glass doesn't mean you have to take a bigger gulp to see what something tastes like. Or you could think of a uh, sample when you go uh, to get a, your blood drawn. Just because you're a bigger person doesn't mean you need a bigger blood sample than like a little baby does. So uh, as long as, because your blood's very well mixed. So think of it as tasting and it's not so surprising. Does that make sense? That the size of the population doesn't enter into your formulas except for this correction factor and this is pretty negligible. Okay? Any questions on that? So just imagine that you, you know, when you're, somebody gives you a taste of something, it's from a bigger glass, you don't say, well, I have to have a much bigger taste, as long as it was stirred up. Let's say it was coffee with sugar in it or something, as long as it's well mixed. Yeah? I have a yeah. Uh, what exactly is the correction factor? 
The correction factor, his question is, what is the correction factor correcting? It's correcting drawing without replacement when we're supposed to be drawing with replacement. These standard error formulas were all, are all um, calculated assuming that we're drawing with replacement, that the odds inside there doesn't change. Does that help you? So that's without the replacement. What sampling is always without replacement, you know, surveys. So we, if you're going to sample half the population, you need to use it. Yeah. So in this class, will it be assumed that our correction factor is going to be irrelevant? Yeah, it is going to be assumed unless I told you you're sampling 50%. You're not going to have to memorize. I would give you this. I would give you this formula. You don't have to memorize it. This is just for your knowledge. Okay? So if I did ask you a question, this would be on there. All right. Any other questions? So now let's just do these confidence intervals here. Um, so I'm going slower now that I know I have more time. Is it too slow? Raise your hand if you think it's too slow. Okay. So now we're on page 61. We're doing these confidence intervals. And um, so let's look at this. So how do we... So we've got this, what's called a point estimate, 47% having a gun. So we can estimate the population that, uh, parameter to be 47%, but give or take what? So the standard error was estimated, it was 1.58, so I really, why did I write this? Let's do 1.6 if we're going to round it, percent, okay? Because 1.58 rounds to 1.6%, all right? So let's just change all this to 1.6%. All right, so the standard error was estimated to be 1.6%. So we estimate that about 47% of all Americans, give or take that, have a gun in their house. We haven't said what give or take means though. So how confident are we that this estimate is right? How sure are we that if we really polled all US adults, all the 200 million, that we'd get 47% um, plus or minus 1.6. That is between 40, whoops, this is wrong and this is wrong. That is between 47% minus 1.6, which is 45.4%, and our upper limit would be 47% plus 1.6, so that would be 48.6%. So in that interval, right? So we're gonna use the normal curve to answer this question about how sure that the true population percentage of all the, in the population would be in this interval. And we're, that's because we can go back to what we knew before. We know that if we, um, we know that the probability histogram for the sample percent follows the normal curve as long as the sample size is large enough. In other words, if we sampled from a population, there's some true population percentage. We just don't know what it is. So there's some, we don't know what it is. Let's just imagine, it's right in the middle here. The true population percent. We don't know what it is. But we know that if we took samples of 1,002 over and over and over again, right, that there's some true population percentage, and once we put it into z-scores, it would follow the normal curve, right there, centered at the true population, and that 68% would be within one and negative one, right? And 95% would be within negative two and two. This is what we know approximately 95%. Now, all we're seeing is one sample. We got 47. So we're 68% sure that it's in here, and we're 95% sure it's in here. Of course, 5% of the time, it could be well out here. So that if we went 47% plus, and once we, trans if we do, once we translate into standard errors, that's a one there, 
if it was way out here, could happen 5% of the time, then we'd go one standard error in either direction and we wouldn't capture the true population percentage. But 68% of the time, we're gonna be in here. The 47% the is gonna be somewhere, 68% of the time, we'll get a sample in here. So then if we took 47% and went one standard error, even if it was right at the edge, if we went one standard error over here in the, each direction, we'd capture that true population parameter. So we say that we're 68% sure that our sample percent is, with one, is within one standard error of the true population percent. That's what we say. We're 95% confident that this interval, 68% confident, this is a six, this right here is a 68% confidence interval because we're adding and subtracting one standard error. And one is associated with 68%. So the idea is um, so in general, this interval, your sample percent, which in this case was 47, plus or minus this, some z-score that's associated with the middle area here. Like here we used a z-score of one, it's called the critical value, and it's associated with 68%. Times our standard error is a 68%, is a, okay, this is, it's hard to read this, but this blank in here is the level of confidence corresponding with this C. Let's do an example. So um, here, the sample percent plus or minus Z star times our standard error, and Z star is called the critical value for the corresponding confidence interval. So let's just do, that. we did this one, let's do the 80%. Okay, 80%, confidence interval is going to be our sample percent plus or minus what? What is the critical value for 80%? So to be 80% confident, we attach which is known as the critical value associated, that's a Z star with 80%, to, that's our er margin of error, to our sample percent. So how do we get that? What, how do we, what's the critical value for 80%? Well, we draw the normal curve, and what we want is 80% in the middle. What is the z-score for 80% in the middle? Between z, this is z star. We'd have to look at it on the table. And this is negative Z star. So that's what we're going to put in here. We know for 68% it's 1, and for 95% we know it's 2. But what is it for 80%? So let's look. So we do it for 80%. We want 80% in the middle. And we can just go to the nearest line and say it's 1.3. If you want to be more accurate, you can use a the p-value calculator. But for now, this is how it will be on the exam. Let's just go to the nearest line. I mean, of course, if you want to say 80% is really between these two lines, 80%, so you could say 1.29, you wouldn't be marked wrong. It's somewhere in between, but if you go to the closest one, that's fine. 1.3. So that would be 1.3 and negative 1.3. So that's there. How about 90%? Well, then we'd have to look, find a 90% confidence interval. So we'd go to 90, and let's look. So 90, we'll just say, okay, 90 is between these two. We can just say 1.65. Go to the closest line. So let's do that. And let's just finish this page here. And now it says, 47, okay, find a 90% confidence interval for the true population percent. And let's do the 90%. So the 90% confidence interval is going to equal what? Our sample percent 
plus or minus 1.65, that's our critical value, times our standard error for percent, which we already cal calculated. So that's 47% plus or minus 1.65 times 1.6%. Um, so then we'll add it, we'll put the lower limit first, 47 minus 1.65 times 1.6, and I got 44.36%, and the upper limit, 47 plus that product. So you say that's a 90% confidence interval. Any questions on that, how to do these? Okay. So now, um, so to which population can you apply this confidence interval to? only the population that you randomly sampled from. So that not all adults worldwide, all adults in the US. You can't, you can only, a confidence interval can only be applied to the population you sampled from. And you can't go to a wider population or a more restricted population. So you can't say Illinois because Illinois isn't, it might apply to Illinois, but certainly if you looked in Idaho or Utah, it's gonna be a higher percentage, or Texas, a place like Massachusetts, probably a lower percentage, okay? Not a wider or more, not a wider or more restricted population. So for these percent problems, we can always use this normal approximation because we don't have to, because the standard, this issue of estimating the standard deviation from a sample is not a big issue. Um, but now, for the next one, just to, this is what we're gonna look at. Now when we start doing these average problems, where, like I say here, we're trying to estimate the average weight, well, knowing this 135 pounds of the average weight of all, what, UI female freshmen, let's say our sample said 135, and then we get the sample SD of 25, but can we use that? I mean, we don't know wh what the distribution looks like, and we don't know if that 135 doesn't, I mean, this could be very different than what's in our population. So we're gonna learn how to adjust this and what assumptions we have to make in order to apply the standard deviation of our sample when we're talking about averages to our um, population. And that's where the T-curve comes in when you're doing averages and don't know the standard deviation of the uh, population. And that's a very widely used uh, distribution and we'll look at that next time, the T-distribution. Okay, that's it for now.